Hello folks, <clears throat> welcome to the second half of our lecture on the reproductive system. In this lecture, we're going to look at the female reproductive system as well as pregnancy, um, childbirth, and the pathophysiology that affects that. This is going to be a significantly longer lecture compared to the last one, just because there's so much more information that we have to cover. The objectives for the lecture, know these for the quiz. And we'll start off with some anatomy. So hopefully you remember from the male reproductive system the difference between a gonad and a gamete. Remember the gonad is the organ, sex organ, gamete is the sex cell. When we talk about the female reproductive system, the sex organ in question is the ovary. That's the gonad. The gamete is the egg cell or ova, or ovum is singular, ova is plural. The ovaries are held inside the pelvic cavity via a bunch of ligaments, the broad ligament, the round ligament, the uterosacral ligament that suspend the ovaries and the uterus and the pelvic cavity. Egg cells develop within the ovary and then at ovulation, um, you see release of usually just one egg cell from the ovary. After ovulation, you have this hole. So you have your ovary and a big hole that is left behind from where that egg cell was released. The cells that surround that hole will fill it in and convert it into um, a, a follicle. It's called a corpus luteum. Um, this thing has a natural lifespan of two weeks. So after two weeks, it'll die off. If, however, that egg cell is fertilized, it will produce a hormone that keeps the corpus luteum alive for a couple of months. We'll look more in detail as to how this happens. So female reproductive system, all suspended within the pelvic cavity. Um, a few things to point out here. I mentioned this in the urinary system lecture, but just to make sure we're still on the same page, remember that the um, orifices for the urinary system, the reproductive system, and the digestive system are all separate. Um, there is no crossover between the urethra and the vagina. Like we see the male system, the urethra is a pathway for both the reproductive and the urinary system. That is not the same in the female reproductive system. Those are two separate systems. So from the ovary then, that egg cell will travel into the uterine tube. You probably know it by its more common name, fallopian tube. Fallopian, uh, this is named after the uh, guy who discovered it. There's a big push to get away from the eponymous names, the naming something after whoever discovered it, um, because eponymous names don't really tell you anything about it. Um, that said, most people know fallopian tube, not uterine tube. The uterine tube attaches to the upper portion of the uterus and kind of comes up and arches over the ovary. And then it has these little projections that look like, if you have seen Finding Nemo, um, they look like the anemone that Nemo lives in. They're called fimbriae. And these little projections are there to catch that egg cell um, once ovulation occurs and then guide it into the uterine tube. From the uterine tube, then that egg cell will travel to the uterus. This is a small organ, about the shape of a pear, about the size of your fist. The upper curved part of the uterus is called the fundus. Um, and then it has this lower neck of the uterus called the cervix, because cervix means neck. Think of the neck of a bottle, for example. That's what we mean when we refer to the cervix. The inner layer of the uterine wall is the endometrium. Anything with metrio refers to the uterus. So the endometrium is the inner uterus. This has a very, very rich blood supply. It has a lot of nutrients. This is where that egg cell, if it's fertilized, will implant and start to grow. If there is pregnancy, um, if the egg cell does implant, then the endometrium will become part of the placenta. If there is no fertilization, then that endometrium just gets shed regularly each month with menstruation. 
So that's the innermost layer of the uterus. The middle layer of the uterus is the myometrium. This is the muscle of the uterus. What kind of muscle is this? Think back to our musculoskeletal lecture, smooth cardiac or skeletal. This is smooth muscle. And it's special smooth muscle because it can still retain its ability to divide and make more muscle cells. Generally speaking, by the time you're done growing, all of your organs that are made up of smooth muscles, so stuff like your stomach, your stomach, your intestines, your bladder, all of those are as big as they're going to get, and the muscle in those stops growing. This is not true about the uterus because the uterus has to get really, really big if it's going to hold a pregnancy to term, and it can't get that big by stretching alone. So it will actually make more muscle cells to accommodate that baby that's growing in the uterus. This also means that the uterus never quite shrinks back to its original size after childbirth. Um, and this is also why women tend to show a little earlier with each subsequent pregnancy because the uterus has gotten bigger. So here's um, what we we're just talking about. You can see ovary right here. These are the fimbrae, these little frond-like projections on the end of the fallopian tube. Um, and then the fallopian tube leading down into the uterus and then the inner lining of the uterus, which is the endometrium. The cervix is the neck of the uterus down here. Um, you can see these big ligaments here that suspend the uterus that kind of hold the uterine tube and the ovary out. And you can see too, they have some pretty big blood vessels um, in them. There's a lot of blood that goes to the female reproductive system. So if that ligament was to rupture for some reason, something goes wrong, um, your patient has a, a very good chance of bleeding out before they can get treated. So this is showing the pathway of the egg cell, um, depending on whether or not fertilization occurs um, or does not occur. And you'll see in both of these, this everything is the same up to here. Um, and actually kind of the same up to here as well. Um, our difference is whether or not there's a fertilized egg cell that's going to implant into the endometrium, or if that egg cell is unfertilized, it's just going to die and be shed off with menstruation. Um, and when that occurs, the endometrium, the lining of the uterus, will either be shed as well during menstruation, or will become part of the placenta and start to nourish that growing baby. Um, the vagina is sometimes called the birth canal. This is the pathway out of, <clears throat> out of the uterus. Um, functions to get anything out or in that comes out or in. So um, this is the birth canal. This is how menstrual flow will get out of the uterus. Um, this is where intercourse occurs, where sperm cells are deposited right in front of the cervix. Some combining forms here referring to the female reproductive system. Anything that you see with O, o or OV uh, refers to either an egg cell or the ovary. This is pronounced OO. And so this word here is an OO site. Salpingo just refers to a tube in general. Um, in this case, we're using it specifically to refer to the uterine tube. But you'll see sal salpingo again when we talk about the special senses, and it will be used in reference to your auditory tubes in your ears. Lots of combining forms that refer to the uterus. We have utero, metrio, hystero, any of those refer to the, nerve, to the uterus. Um, colpo and vagino both refer to the vagina. I would know colpo for the quiz. So we worked our way inside and now we're outside. Um, external genitalia is collectively known as the vulva, and this includes a few things. Um, the labia, which are just folds of skin um, that serve to protect both the vaginal opening and also the urethra to make sure that nothing gets in there where it does not belong. Um, and then clitoral tissue, which is erectile tissue, um, develops from the same tissue as the penis does in the male. Um, this area in between the vaginal opening and the anus is called the perineum. Um, and this is where an episiotomy is performed. If you have to open up the vaginal opening to make it a little bigger so that that baby's head can get out, um, you'll cut the vaginal opening 
um, using an episiotomy. It should always be performed off to the side, left or right. Should never be performed down or up. If you go down, you run the risk of cutting into the rectum. If you cut up, you run the risk of cutting into the urethra and the bladder. Um, and then you have a whole bunch of issues there. So episiotomy always performed out to one side or the other. Um, and a note while we're talking about this area of the body, um, you will, well, not you will see. Um, there are common practices among some cultures um, in which the labia are removed, sur uh, well, not surgically, in which the labia are removed, um, called female circumcision um, or female genital cutting. Um, there are different degrees of female circumcision. This is not like male circumcision, um, which can have some health benefits. This, generally speaking, does not have health benefits and, and usually causes a lot of health issues. Um, there are varying degrees of female circumcision. Some of them involve just removal of the labia. Some of them involve removal of both the labia and the clitoris. Um, in very severe cases of female circumcision, um, all three, labia, menorah, and majora, and the clitoral tissue are removed, and then um, the vaginal opening is sewn shut with a very small hole left at the bottom to allow for urine and menstrual flow to, to get out. Um, this, like I said, does not have any health benefits, tends to be very detrimental um, to the mother, especially in childbirth, because it leaves a lot of scar tissue and children only have to be cut back open um, in order to permit childbirth. Um, also tends to significantly increase risk of urinary tract infections, other infections um, within the pelvic cavity, it is illegal in the U.S. Female genitals um, mutilation is illegal in the U.S. So if you do find it, you are required by law to report that um, to, to CPS. Um, we do have a, a fairly high number of populations in uh, Colorado that traditionally practice FGM. It's very, very common in Somali and Sudanese populations. Um, estimated that a good 90 to 95 percent of women in those countries have had um, some form of genital cutting, um, usually to the more severe end of it. Anyway, um, so that's something you might see in your medical practice. Hopefully not. Um, it's, it's not especially common, though you do see a, a small growing percentage of um, cases in the U.S. So the perineum, like I mentioned earlier, this is the region in between the thighs that goes from the vulva to the anus. This is where an episiotomy is performed. Last of our organs that we'll look at are mammary glands, which technically are not reproductive tissue, uh, but once that baby shows up, you've got to feed him something. And in places where there is no infamil, um, that is milk. Uh, mammary tissue is made up of glandular tissue that's actually going to make milk and then fat that provides energy, nutrients for the milk. And the function of mammary glands obviously is to make milk to nourish a baby. In the U.S. we also use them to sell beer in cars. Milk is made by those glands carried by ductwork to the nipple. The very first milk that mom makes right after she gives birth is called colostrum. This does not look the same as normal milk. It looks kind of thin and watery, but it's chock full of antibodies and is kind of like baby's first vaccine. Recommended that newborns start nursing within an hour after birth. And part of the reason for that is so that they can get that colostrum and get those antibodies into their system and have some protection from diseases that might be around them. These are just combining forms that talk about accessory stuff. Um, here's episio. We talked about episiotomy, so it's cutting of the vulva. Um, masto and mammo both refer to breast tissue. This is where we get our, world, our word mammal from that combining form mammo, because a mammal is simply an animal that makes milk to feed its young. So humans, your dog, bats, dolphins, whales, horses, they're all mammals because they all have mammary glands to feed their young. Okay, so that's the anatomy of the female reproductive system, which is fairly straightforward. Now let's look at the physiology, what's going on um, with monthly changes throughout the female reproductive system.
The very first menstrual period that a girl has is called menarche. Um, in the US, average age is about 11 to 12. This is all controlled by the anterior pituitary gland, which is a little gland that you find in your brain. We'll talk about it more when we talk about the endocrine system. Um, the menstrual cycle begins with this hormone called FSH, which we saw in the male reproductive system. FSH is follicle stimulating hormone, and this triggers development of an egg cell. So an egg cell will start to ripen and develop and grow. And as that egg cell grows, it produces estrogen. And that estrogen goes to the uterus and starts to prepare the uterus to receive what will possibly be a fertilized egg. Um, at about two weeks of growth, you'll see this uh, little spurt of luteinizing hormone also from the pituitary. Remember when I talked about the male reproductive system, luteinizing hormone was the hormone that triggered release of, of sperm cells into the seminiferous tubules. It's the same here, luteinizing hormone triggers release of that egg cell um, from the ovary into the fallopian tube, and then the follicle, the hole that's left behind in the ovary, becomes the corpus luteum. Corpus luteum means yellow body, because it looks kind of yellow if you actually do an autopsy or surgery and you see a corpus luteum. Now the corpus luteum stays in the ovary and it produces progesterone and estrogen. It mainly produces progesterone and progesterone is the pregnancy hormone. Remember P for progesterone, P for pregnancy. And remember I said that the corpus luteum has a lifespan of about 14 days. After 14 days, it will just die off naturally. And then you'll see this decrease in progesterone and then the endometrium will be sloughed off and you'll see menstruation. The average cycle should be about 28 days, give or take. Um, ov ovulation should occur then right at day 14. You can tell when ovulation occurred by taking the first day of menstruation and counting back 14 days because that should be the day of um, ovulation because the corpus luteum only lives 14 days. So this shows us, there's a lot going on here, but this shows us everything that's happening in both the ovary and the uterus and all the hormones that are involved. So up here on the top we have the ovary and the hormones involved with the ovary. You can see FSH, which is the little blue line right here. Um, FSH levels stay pretty steady and then they start to increase um, right before ovulation as that egg cell gets bigger and bigger. And then you see this sudden really big spike in LH right before ovulation to trigger ovulation. And then FSH and LH levels stay pretty low um, until you start developing a new egg cell at the, at the beginning of the next cycle. During the time that this egg cell is getting bigger, you notice hopefully estrogen levels are starting to increase. Um, you get this little drop in estrogen right before ovulation. And if you ever want to see reproductive physiologists fight about something, ask them why that is, because there's no real solid um, knowledge right now as to why you see that drop in estrogen. After ovulation, when you now have a corpus luteum, now that corpus luteum is making lots of progesterone. So you see high progesterone levels, and then as that corpus luteum starts to die off, those progesterone levels decrease as well. So those are hormones coming from the ovary. Let's look at the endometrium itself. Day one of um, the menstrual cycle is the first day of menstruation. which should last you know, three to five days, give or take. And then you see this increase in the endometrium due to estrogen that's coming to the uterus and preparing the uterus to receive, um, in theory, what could be a fertilized egg. After ovulation, progesterone increases the lining of the uterus and keeps it really thick. And then when we see at the end here, the corpus luteum dying off, progesterone levels decreasing, that's what causes 
shedding of the endometrium and that's what causes menstruation. So menarche is the first menstrual cycle. Menopause then is the end of menstruation. And this usually takes place between about 45 to 55 years of age, though there's some evidence that women might enter kind of a pre-menopause, even like 10 years before menopause. During menopause, um, egg cells have kind of degenerated. There are not a lot of them left. Hormone levels then are starting to decrease, especially estrogen and progesterone. And you see some signs associated with this, um, hot flashes, headaches, sometimes issues with insomnia or mood swings. Sometimes the insomnia can get worse because of the hot flashes. <clears throat> um, urinary issues, sometimes increases in UTIs, vaginal dryness. There are different medications that you can take to kind of address the symptoms of menopause. Obviously, you can't reverse menopause. Once you go through it, it's done. Um, hormone replacement therapy gives supplemental estrogen and progesterone to make up for the hormones that you're no longer making. Now, the issue with hormone replacement therapy is that this does increase your risk of breast cancer. And it increases your risk of breast cancer the longer that you're on hormone replacement therapy. So good thing to discuss with your doctor, weigh the pros and cons. I think the good news is once you go off hormone replacement therapy, that then decreases your risk of, of developing breast cancer. Antidepressants can help with mood swings. Vitamin E is good for hot flashes. Generally speaking, menopause lasts a year or so, and then your symptoms should all be over and done, more or less. So different means of contraception. Obviously, this is not a sex ed class, but we will talk about stuff like this um, because you need to know how to educate your patients. So three different methods of contraception. Um, one stops sperm from getting up to the egg. Um, and then if you do have a fertilized egg, you can keep it from implanting in the lining of the uterus. You can also just prevent ovulation as well. Sterilization in men and women um, varies. A vasectomy in men, a tubal ligation, you hear people talk about getting their tubes tied in women. Um, in men, a, a vasectomy is much simpler. This is an outpatient procedure. He'll have that vasectomy done and then He'll be home that afternoon, probably with a bag of frozen peas on his crotch. Um, a tubal ligation for women is much more expensive and a little more intensive because it is an internal procedure. So she'll probably spend the night at the hospital just to watch for any complications. So if the two of you are having that conversation, make him go get the surgery because it's at the very least, it's a lot cheaper. Both of these are reversible. to varying degrees. Um, vasectomy, I think, has a little more success being reversed. Uh, microsurgery has come a long way. Um, tubal ligations can also be reversed, but I don't think they're as commonly done, and it's a, a slightly more complicated procedure, but they can be reversed if you change your mind. This is surgical sterilization. So in a vasectomy, you're going in and cutting the vas deferens so that sperm cells can't get from the testes into the pelvic cavity. In a tubal ligation, you're going in and cutting and then either clamping or cauterizing um, the fallopian tube so that sperm cells can't get up the fallopian tube and the egg cell can't get down to the uterus. Um, quite often this is done now laparoscopically. So you will um, pump your patient's abdomen full of carbon dioxide to kind of inflate it and then go in with a little laparoscope and cauterize the fallopian tubes that way. Um, this is much better than the old procedures that required actually cutting your patient open. So these are different family planning methods that are available. Again, like I said, this is not a sex ed class, so we're not going to go over all of these in detail, but these are based on how effective they are at preventing unwanted pregnancy. Um, all the stuff in yellow is reversible. The stuff in blue is, generally speaking, not reversible. Um, from the very bottom to the very top, um, everything in this category, if you have 100 women who are using these different methods, you'll have, on average, 18 of them will get pregnant. 
Um, in our second category here, if 100 women are using these methods on average 6 to 12, and then up here, the very most effective of 100 women use these methods, um, you'll have less than one of them will get pregnant a year. So our reversible non-hormonal stuff includes things like condoms, both male and female. They do make female condoms. Um, they're not quite as commonly used in the U.S. Condoms, if you remember from our talk about STIs, should always be used to reduce any risk of um, transmission of sexual infections. Um, other reversible non-hormonal methods, um, use of spermicide, use of a sponge to block the cervix, um, withdrawal method, um, so making sure that ejaculation doesn't occur within the female reproductive system. And then there are some fertility awareness-based methods, um, some of which can actually be highly effective with um, effective rates up into the 90s that are based on checking for changing signs in the body, checking basal body temperature, checking cervical mucus, um, and then charting to see when fertility will occur and then avoiding sex um, on days that you could possibly be fertile. When we look at hormonal stuff, this has a higher effective rate. Um, and this is stuff like um, the Depo-Provera shot, the pill, the patch, um, the Nuvering, which actually I think was taken off the market, um, diaphragms. Usually these are um, hormonal that will interact with ovulation. And then the ones that are most popular are our LARCs, long-acting reversible contraceptive. And these are things like the nexplanone implant that goes in the upper arm, intrauterine devices that go into the uterus. These are usually good for several years, I believe, um, de depending on the type of device. And generally speaking, I have very good outcomes. Now, you will see some common side effects with different types of birth control. Um, depends on, on the type of hormonal birth control you're using. These can be anything from uh, headaches to sometimes spotting in between periods, um, sometimes mood swings, decreased libido. There are a few side effects that are concerning. Um, so hormonal birth controls, even very low-dose hormonal birth controls, increase your risk of breast and cervical cancers. Um, this was a study that came out end of 2017 or 2018, um, out of, looking out of uh, Denmark, I believe, at a very, very large cohort. Um, and they, they did see a slight increase in risk of breast and cervical cancer if you're on hormonal birth control. Now, it will decrease your risk of ovarian and uterine cancer, so good to talk with your doctor and see which one are you more at risk for what would work better giving you know your family history now if you go off of the hormonal birth control then that does decrease your risk of breast and cervical cancer that goes away um, pulmonary thrombosis or pulmonary embolism and deep vein thrombosis are particularly concerning um, and have had several birth controls that have been kicked off of the market because of that increased risk um, if you remember I don't know if you do or not, um, there was a birth control called YAZ, Y-A-Z. Um, the ads for it were always a bunch of women sitting around in a nightclub talking about birth control. Don't get your birth control advice from some random chick in a nightclub. Um, it was pulled off of the market because a number of women developed clots, blood clots in their veins, especially in their legs, and a number of women actually died because of pulmonary embolism. They got a blood clot that traveled up to their lungs and blocked blood flow to their lungs. Um, and enough women died from that that Yaz was pulled off the market. Um, this is not uncommon with hormonal birth controls. And if you have ever been on a hormonal birth control and you've gone in to get antibiotics, um, you know that they will ask you, are you on birth control? Because some antibiotics will interact with the way that hormonal birth controls work and increase your risk of blood clots. Um, the other kind of new study looking at birth control also came out of Scandinavia somewhere, I think Denmark as well, showed an increase in depression um, associated with using hormonal birth control. This increase was greatest in teenagers and young adult women. Um, and again, this depression went away uh, usually after you went off of the hormonal birth control. So some real side effects there to, to be concerned about. Talk to your doctor if you have any questions about them. 
Right? The answer here is not go flush your birth control down the toilet. Um, the answer is just to make sure that you know what side effects could possibly crop up and you know, be aware if they do. And of course, if you have questions about your birth control, make sure that you're talking regularly with your doctor. These are some key terms referring to the female reproductive system. Um, these are very useful as you're working through your homework. And let's talk about some clinical stuff. Uh, we're not going to talk a lot about infections just because we've kind of beat STDs to death in the last lecture. Um, most infections of the female reproductive tract are some kind of STI, um, which will lead to things like inflammation of the vagina, vaginitis. We talked about pelvic inflammatory disease a little bit. This is inflammation of the uterus and the fallopian tubes. This can lead to infertility later on, especially if it's not treated right away. And um, it's not uncommon for PID to go for a while because it tends to be asymptomatic. You have this just inflammation of the female reproductive tract that doesn't really show any symptoms. Fibroids are increased growths in the uterus that can cause really heavy bleeding and feel like pressure on the rectum or the, or the bladder. Sometimes if they're not too big, you can have the fibroids themselves removed, but if they are very large, you might have to have the whole uterus itself removed. Endometriosis is a very common um, condition of the female reproductive system. This happens when you get endometrial tissue, that lining of the uterus, outside of the uterus. It travels backwards up the fallopian tubes during menstruation and gets into the pelvic cavity. Um, you see lots and lots of pain associated with endometriosis, um, issues with infertility. Um, it can be very hard to conceive if you have endometriosis. Usually you'll do a laparoscopy like we saw in the picture for um, doing a, a tubal ligation, you'll do a laparoscopy to look in the pelvic cavity, see if your patient has endometriosis, and you can even burn off those little patches of endometrial tissue. Um, the reason why endometriosis is so painful is because that tissue, even though it's not inside the uterus anymore, it still responds to the hormonal changes that you see in the body. So it will still grow and die off and grow and die off the same way that it would in the uterus. These are common places to find endometrial tissue. Um, you see it a lot along the outside of the uterus. Um, a lot of it kind of hooked onto the large intestine or on the ovary. Um, and again, usually you'll go in and cauterize. You'll burn off that endometrial tissue. And sometimes it works, sometimes it comes back. Endometriosis can be difficult to treat. Some terms here that you should know for the quiz. Oligomenorrhea refers to very light menstrual flow. Um, your patient is having her, her regular periods, but she has very, very little blood with each period. Menorrhagia is just the opposite. This suffix here, rhagia, this is our suffix that we see in hemorrhage. So this is very heavy flow of menstruation. Um, amenorrhea just means your patient is not having um, monthly menstruation for whatever reason. And then dysmenorrhea, remember our prefix dys is difficult or painful. So painful menstruation usually associated with cramps. These can be caused by any number of things and it can be hard to determine uh, which cause or if there are multiple causes. It can be um, imbalances in hormones, it could be other issues in the body, maybe your patient has low thyroid hormone, for example. It could be issues with the uterus itself. PMS is most common um, in adolescence and more common as you get near menopause. These are symptoms that occur in the second half of the cycle, usually right before menstruation. Um, you'll see like general emotional changes, sometimes mood swings, fatigue, bloating, changes in appetite, sometimes headaches. Depending on the symptom, there are different things that you can do. Hormone therapy um, can help sometimes in very severe cases of PMS, as can antidepressants and anti-anxieties. Um, a lot of the time, doctors will try and keep kind of a low profile approach to treating PMS. So focusing first on stuff like practicing um, relaxation techniques, um, over-the-counter pain medications, exercise, sometimes changes in diet can help with uh, PMS type symptoms.
Polycystic ovarian syndrome is another very common uh, issue with the female reproductive system. This is an endocrine disorder where you see very high levels of androgen and estrogen. Androgen is just a form of testosterone. And these high levels of androgen and estrogen shut off FSH and LH, so your patient doesn't ovulate, which means that they generally have issues with infertility, and you do see lots of issues with infertility and PCOS. Um, your patient usually doesn't menstruate or has very, very scanty menstruation and sometimes goes very long between menstrual cycles. Um, sometimes you'll see excess hair growth called hirsutism. I think I spelled that correctly. Um, usually on the chin, like where you would see a, a beard on a man, and that's because of the high testosterone levels. Um, and then there's some evidence that PCOS might be a sign of prediabetes because your patient will start to develop insulin resistance, their sugar levels, their A1C will go up, and you'll see weight gain as well. Um, treatment for PCOS usually depends on what's going on. You can give hormonal medications or other drugs. Um, often you see PCOS treated with metformin, which is a common drug that you give a patient with type 1 di or type 2 diabetes. Weight loss can work as well. Um, and sometimes you'll do a wedge resection of an ovary. You'll just cut a small part out of the, an ovary and that will kind of jumpstart it back into making normal hormone levels. Now, aside from the issue of possibly getting diabetes, PCOS is concerning because PCOS increases your risk of endometrial cancer. This is the most common cancer in the female reproductive system. Um, this is not detected by a pap smear. Pap smear looks for cervical cancer. It's not looking for cancer of the lining of the uterus. Treatment for endometrial cancer is generally hysterectomy. Um, and then from there, you'll do your classic chemo and radiation. Um, the nice news about this, aside from the fact that you have to lose your uterus, is that the five-year survival rate for endometrial cancer is very good. Your patient um, will usually have a very good outcome. Now, cervical cancer is um, usually caused by HPV, human papilloma virus. Just about everybody has some form of HPV. And I know when I say HPV, you're thinking like sexually transmitted disease, genital warts, that is not the case. There are lots and lots and lots of different strains of human papilloma virus. Some of them cause cancer, or some of them cause genital warts. Some of them cause warts in other places in the body. If you've ever had warts on your hands or warts on your feet, you have HPV. It's just a matter of which strain of HPV you have um, that, that may cause genital warts. And then out of all the strains that cause genital warts, there are specific strains of HPV that increase the risk of cervical cancer. Before your patient develops cervical cancer, you'll see usually abnormal epithelial cells in the inside of the cervix. And this is what you're looking for when you're doing a pap smear, taking cells from the inside and the outside of the cervix to check and see if there are any abnormal cells. If there are, then your next step would be to do a colposcopy and a biopsy. So you would go in with a camera um, to look at the cervix. You spray the cervix down with acetic acid, which is just vinegar, and any abnormal cells on the cervix will bubble under that vinegar. And that's how you know which cells to biopsy. And then you'll take those, um, cut them off, send them to pathology and see if, if your patient has cervical cancer. Now, the HPV vaccine, the Gardasil vaccine, that was rolled out you know, 20 years ago or so, protects against a bunch of different strains of the virus. The current one protects against the nine most common strains of HPV that are most likely to cause cervical cancer. It does not protect against all strains of HPV, um, but it does protect against those. Um, in the time since we've seen the Gardasil vaccine rolled out, the, the last 20 years or so, we have seen a decrease in cervical cancer cases. So we do know that this is working. Um, now, Gardasil is frequently touted as the cervical cancer vaccine for women, um, but should men receive Gardasil as well? They should, um, because men can also contract HPV and get genital warts, and those can lead to issues with penile cancer. Um, so HPV is good shot to have for everybody. Ovarian cancer, um, unlike 
cervical cancer does not really have a test for it. Um, we, we can't pick up on ovarian cancer with a pap smear. And ovarian cancer generally does not show very early symptoms. If you do see early symptoms, they're vague, bloating, cramping, fatigue. I mean, that sounds like yesterday after too much Taco Bell, right? Then because you don't see a lot of early symptoms with ovarian cancer, you tend to see a very high mortality rate with ovarian cancer um, because it's usually not caught until very late stages. Treatment of ovarian cancer uh, depends on what stage you catch it in. If you catch it early, you might just do an oophorectomy, remove the ovary. Um, if it's caught when it's a little further on, you might do a salpingectomy, remove the egg or remove the ovary and the fallopian tube, or you may have to do a complete hysterectomy and remove the uterus and everything else that's involved. And then of course, chemotherapy and radiation for follow-up. Breast cancer is the second leading cause of cancer-related deaths in women in the U.S. Do you guys remember what was the first one? We looked at it two weeks ago, I think. So number two is breast cancer. Number one is lung cancer. And then I think number three is uh, colon cancer. Breast cancer is the second leading cause of cancer-related deaths because breast cancer spreads very easily through the lymph nodes throughout the body. Breast cancer is screened for using a mammography, which is just an x-ray of the breast tissue. Um, if you see any kind of lumps or abnormalities in the breast tissue, then you'll probably go in and do a biopsy, remove cells from that lump um, and see what's going on there if it truly is cancerous tissue. Treatment for breast cancer varies. Um, usually your patient will opt for a mastectomy, which is just complete removal of the breast tissue. If it is small cancer, you might just do a lumpectomy and remove the tumor, but it's very common to see a full mastectomy and often a double mastectomy, uh, especially if your patient is worried about that cancer coming to the other breast. And then from there, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and then hormone therapy is very important with breast cancer because certain types of breast cancer respond to certain hormones. Some breast cancers grow in the presence of estrogen, some grow in the presence of progesterone, some grow in the presence of both. So it's important to see which hormone that breast cancer is responding to and then treat it accordingly. Um, so here are our key terms here. Um, these are just everything that we've been talking about. Um, like I always say, good stuff to know for the quiz when you're studying for that. Okay, now we're going to get into fertilization, pregnancy, and childbirth. So fertilization occurs when a sperm cell and an egg cell come together and the nuclei in the sperm and the egg cell fuse. And then you get, remember, 23 um, chromosomes in the in the egg or the sperm cell from the male, 23 chromosomes in the egg cell from the female. Those come together, and now you have 46 one copy of each chrom or two copies of each chromosome in the egg cell. Um, and now you've restored your chromosome number, and you have a whole new individual. A fertilized egg is called a zygote, um, and we call it that for the first like, week or two. Um, Fertilization occurs in the fallopian tube. It occurs towards the top of the fallopian tube, actually. And then after fertilization occurs, that egg cell will travel down the fallopian tube towards the uterus. It will divide very quickly on the way, one cell becoming two, becoming four, becoming eight, becoming um, 64, and then will burrow into the endometrium. Part of that endometrium will become the placenta and, and part of the zygote will become the placenta as well. From week zero to eight, we refer to um, our developing baby as an embryo. And then from week eight until birth, uh, we refer to it as a fetus. Fetus is um, our Latin term. It just means offspring or small one. So this diagram then is tracing the pathway of fertilization, everything that we just talked about on the last two slides. So starting at the cervix, sperm cells are deposited right there at the front of the cervix. They travel through the cervix up into the uterus, and then they have to pick left or right. 
only one ovary, generally speaking, is going to have an egg cell available. So all the sperm cells that went to the left, they fell out the fallopian tube and died a sad death in the pelvic cavity. Um, at the same time, while these sperm cells are making it through the cervix up into the uterus and up through the fallopian tube, they have to dodge a whole bunch of white blood cells. The female reproductive tract is full of white blood cells to fight off any potential infection. So our sperm cells that chose correctly and make it up the fallopian tube on the right are the ones that are going to find that egg cell there waiting for them. And um, I know that sometimes when you talk about fertilization, uh, you talk about egg cells, you talk about the, the fastest cell or the fastest sperm. You hear people talk about, oh, I can't believe he was the fastest sperm. In reality, that's not how that works. Um, because the egg cell, the ovum, is covered with this little hard capsule, almost like a shell, called the zona pellucida. And sperm cells have a little cap on their top of their head um, called the acrosome that has a bunch of enzymes that will eat through that zona pellucida. But it takes a lot of sperm cells and a lot of acrosomes to eat through the zona pellucida. So usually it's not the first sperm, usually it's the last one that shows up when all the other sperm cells have died off trying to make it through the zona that finally gets through on its own. So work smarter, not harder. After fertilization occurs up in the fallopian tube, that egg cell is going to be carried down the fallopian tube down into the uterus. It will bounce around the uterus for a day or two and then implant into the endometrium and then start developing um, into a, an embryo and then into a fetus. The placenta is formed from chorion, which is part of the developing zygote. Um, it splits into a couple of pieces um, as it's developing and from the endometrium, the lining of the uterus. The placenta serves to nourish the fetus. It brings oxygen and nutrients to the fetus. It removes waste products and carbon dioxide. It essentially serves as the lung and the digestive tract and the liver. It does a lot. The umbilical cord um, links the fetus to the placenta. If you've ever had a baby, you know that. There are two arteries and one vein in the placenta or in the umbilical cord running to the placenta. Um, this is what we see right here. It's a fairly large organ attached to the wall of the uterus. Other fetal uh, membranes that you find during birth um, are the amniotic sac. This is what we see right here. Sometimes you see babies that are born um, when the amniotic sac doesn't rupture. Uh, we call it born on call. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. You'll just tear that sac open as soon as that baby's born. Um, when you hear someone talk about their water breaking, that's what they're referring to is that sac rupturing at the beginning of labor and the amniotic fluid in the sac um, then escaping through the vagina. After the amniotic sac ruptures, uh, delivery should be pretty imminent within about 24 hours or so because that amniotic sac this is what protects against pathogens. This is going to keep that baby safe from any kind of infection. Once that amniotic sac has ruptured, bacteria and viruses can get up into it and get into the baby. So that baby needs to be delivered you know, within 24 hours or so to, to prevent any kind of infection. We talked a little bit about changes in the heart in babies, um, when we talked about the cardiovascular system, there are some adaptations to keep blood from going to the lungs in, in a fetus because you don't need to send blood to the lungs. Um, you're not going to get any oxygen there. All the oxygen is coming from mom across the placenta. So there are a couple of ways that we bypass that pulmonary artery. One is the foramen ovale, which is a little hole in between septa um, or in between the atria to allow blood to just go from the right atrium directly into the left atrium. And then you also see this tiny little artery called the ductus arteriosus. That takes blood from the pulmonary artery into the aorta. Again, just so we don't have to send blood to the lungs. Now at birth, when that baby takes its first breath, both of those bypasses should close. And then you'll establish that pulmonary circuit and you will start sending blood to the lungs. If they don't close at birth, there are medications that you can give that will help them close. 
If those don't work, you will have to go in and surgically close those because now you have mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood in the heart and the baby's not getting as much oxygen as it needs. So this is showing um, our, our fetal circulation. You can see here the foraminal valley with blood going from the right atrium into the left atrium. And then here's our ductus arteriosus with blood going from the left pulmonary artery up into the aorta. Again, this will close at birth, soon after birth. Here's our full term um, fetus, asleep and cozy in the uterus. You can see the placenta is fairly high up on the uterus here towards the top of the uterus. That's where it should be. Um, you don't want the placenta down near the cervix. Um, if that happens, then the placenta will detach and come out first. Uh, we call that placenta previa, and that's all kinds of bad because that means that the baby that's still in the uterus is not getting any more oxygen because the placenta has detached from the uterus. So pregnancy should last about 38 weeks, um, 40 weeks from the last menstrual period if you're counting back then. In Colorado, women tend to give birth a little earlier, about 38, 37 weeks, and it's estimated that this is because of the low oxygen up here. Eventually, you get to the point where mom can't provide enough oxygen for that baby and the baby needs to come out. And there's actually some interesting research going on at UC Health. Um, they have field studies that they do up in Peru um, and in Bolivia, where women live at very, very high elevation, higher than they are here. And they see what that elevation does to the uterus and to blood pressure and oxygen in the uterus. It's really interesting research. Um, pregnancy is divided into three trimesters. Each trimester is three months long. Um, this is where we talk about first and second and third trimesters. The scientific term, medical term for giving birth is parturition. And there are three stages to parturition. I was doing a review with a class once and asked a student, what are the three stages of childbirth? And she told me they're cramp, push, and hold your baby, which is not wrong, actually. Um, so first stage, the cramp stage of childbirth, you see contractions of the uterus. Um, the cervix is dilating. It's opening up to about 10 centimeters, uh, which I think is about the size of a bagel if you need something to visualize. And the cervix is also effacing. It's thinning out and kind of retracting into the uterus. Second stage, the push stage, um, is actual delivery of the fetus um, or feti, depending on how many babies are in there. And then the third stage or the last one, you're delivering the fetal membranes, the placenta and the amniotic sac. This is important because uh, you want to check that placenta. When it comes out, it needs to be whole. If there are parts or pieces of the placenta that are still in the uterus. Uh, this significantly increases mom's risk of hemorrhage when the uterus starts to contract um, and shrink back down to its normal size. These are two terms here that I would know for the quiz, gravida and para. Gravida refers to a pregnant woman. Para refers to a woman who gave birth. So if you have a patient who is monogravida, which is how we would use that, um, you have a patient who's given birth once. If you have a patient who's um, bigravida, then she has given birth twice. And then generally speaking, most OBGYNs um, can't count past two. So anything after that is just multigravida. Um, para is giving birth. So a mono Paris woman would be a woman who's given birth once, or by Paris would be twice, and then again, um, OBGYNs can't count past two, so after that you just have a multi-Paris patient. Um, could you have a patient who is um, you know, multi-gravida and mono-Paris? She's been pregnant multiple times but only given birth once? Mm -hmm. You could have, yeah, you could have a patient who's maybe had miscarriages, you can't have a patient who is, you know, like never been pregnant, but still has given birth. That doesn't work. But you can have patients who, who have been pregnant, but not given birth. If you have a patient who has never been pregnant, you would call that nulli. Um, N-U-L-L-I means not or none or never. So nulli gravida, nulli paris would be if you've never been pregnant, you've never given birth.
Oxytocin is the hormone that runs labor. It comes from the brain, from the pituitary. It does a whole bunch of stuff. Labor and uterine contractions are kind of the big, big thing that it's known for. So as that baby gets big, you know, around month nine or so, that baby's going to get into position for delivery. And when it gets into position, that baby's head is going to push against the cervix. And that's going to trigger nerve impulses to the brain that tells the brain to release oxytocin. That oxytocin will go down to the uterus, will cause uterus to contract, and that will push the baby's head against the cervix. And then that pressure will tell the brain to release oxytocin. The oxytocin will cause contractions of the uterus that will push the baby's head against the cervix further. And you see how this keeps ramping up. Um, ultimately, this will end once that baby is out of there. Lactation is secretion of milk. This is run by two hormones, prolactin that comes from the anterior pituitary and then hormones from the placenta um, that, that cause uh, breast tissue development. Milk is released by suckling and oxytocin also plays a role here. It causes contraction of breast tissue um, to allow for milk letdown. Like I mentioned earlier, the very first milk that mom makes is called colostrum. This is chock full of antibodies, highly, highly protective for the baby. Really important that baby gets that colostrum within you know, the first hour after birth. After the first 24 to 48 hours, um, mom's milk will change and it will go back to um, what you would traditionally think of as milk. She'll start lactating. These are all combining forms that have to do with pregnancy and with childbirth. Um, a couple that I'd point out, toco uh, refers to any kind of labor. Um, dystocia is the term for a difficult labor, something's gone wrong. Um, there's gravida and para down here. Again, know those words for the quiz. Some key terms here referring to pregnancy and birth. Most of these we've gone over, but I would definitely read for them um, on your own time and for the homework. So some clinical stuff that we see with pregnancy and with childbirth. Infertility, we talked about infertility in men, and we've seen in this lecture, there are a number of things that can cause infertility in women. Anything from past history of STDs, which will lead to issues with pelvic inflammatory disease. You can see damage to the reproductive system, hormonal imbalances, all, all number of things. Endometriosis will cause issues with infertility, PCOS as well. Remember when we talked about infertility in men, I told you that 30, a third of the time it's the cause is something to do with the man. A third of the time the infertility is because of the woman. And then a third of the time we don't know uh, what's going on. There's, we can't really find an answer to the infertility, which I'm sure is very frustrating for the couple. An ectopic pregnancy happens when you get a fertilized egg that implants and develops somewhere outside of the uterus. Usually this is in the fallopian tube. It can be anywhere, but fallopian tube tends to be the most common. Um, there are different things that will increase your risk of ectopic pregnancy. Uh, that pelvic inflammatory disease that I mentioned earlier, that will cause inflammation of the fallopian tube, which is salpingitis, and that inflammation can damage the fallopian tube and make it difficult for the egg cell to get down into the uterus, and so instead it implants in the fallopian tube. Endometriosis also increases your risk of ectopic pregnancy. Usually symptoms of ectopic pregnancy are very mild, and you don't know that you have it until the fallopian tube ruptures. And then that's very painful, your patient will start bleeding, they'll need to go in for emergency surgery. Sometimes your patient will talk about pain, if your patient's talking about pain in the lower, very low pelvis, and usually just on one side, um, that would be a good reason to take a look and see what's going on. And generally speaking, not a bad idea to get a, an ultrasound around like week six or so, just to visualize the pregnancy. Make sure that it's in the uterus where it belongs and not in the fallopian tube. Treatment for ectopic pregnancy will be going in and surgically removing both the fallopian tube and the pregnancy. Um, there is unfortunately no way to kind of re-implant 
that pregnancy once has occurred. That's kind of like rooting up a tree. Um, you, you aren't able to transfer it into the uterus. Um, you have to remove the entire fallopian tube because the damage caused by ectopic pregnancy significantly increases the risk that mom's going to have another ectopic pregnancy later. Now, she hopefully still has the fallopian tube on the other side, so she can still get pregnant, but her fertility rate is going to decrease. If she has an ectopic pregnancy there, then she's going to have to have both fallopian tubes removed, um, and then you'll have to look at stuff like in vitro fertilization. Pregnancy-induced hypertension is also called preeclampsia. This is high blood pressure during pregnancy. Cause of, hyperten of the hypertension is not well understood. Right now, the hypothesis is that mom is making so many blood vessels in the baby and in the placenta that it just throws off her own blood pressure. Signs that you'll see of preeclampsia, oliguria, so very scanty amount of urine with protein in it, proteinuria, and then edema, especially in the feet and the lower legs. For those of you who have been pregnant, you probably had edema anyway. You probably had buildup of fluid in the feet and the legs. Sometimes with preeclampsia, you'll see pain in the right side of the abdomen. If it's a very severe preeclampsia, because the liver is affected by preeclampsia as well. The concern with preeclampsia, you, if you catch it, you want to watch it very quickly. Um, because it can lead to full-blown eclampsia, in which your patient's blood pressure and protein levels get completely thrown off balance, and then you see some really, really nasty complications with eclampsia, seizures, coma, death of the mother, death of the baby. It's very, very scary condition. Um, and actually, right now is a, a nice time to discuss some issues that we see with maternal health in the US um, compared to other developed nations, somewhere like Sweden or France or Germany or the UK or Australia, um, where does the United States rank in terms of maternal mortality? Very good, very bad, somewhere in the middle. Currently, the US is dead last in terms of maternal mortality when it comes to developed nations. Now, if you're comparing us to Afghanistan, we have really good outcomes. But if you're comparing us to somewhere like Australia or New Zealand, we have very, very bad outcomes for maternal health. Um, one of the reasons, there are so many, one of the suspected reasons is losing or missing a diagnosis of preeclampsia. Um, either during pregnancy or after pregnancy, preeclampsia can happen up to six weeks after delivery. For those of you who have had babies, you know that the baby went in in like week one, week two, the baby saw the doctor a bunch after delivery. You probably saw your doctor, your OBGYN, six weeks after delivery, which is a perfect amount of time for a case of preeclampsia to crop up after that baby's born. So this is one of the reasons why we see a very high maternal mortality rate in the U.S. Um, misdiagnosis, lack of attention, lack of care after delivery. There's fortunately more and more discussion about this in the US and there are um, some study groups that have been formed to look at what exactly is going on, why women in the United States have such poor maternal outcomes. Um, this is just a little diagram of ectopic pregnancy showing different places that it can occur. You can get, in theory, that implant or that fertilized egg can implant anywhere. Again, the most common place that you usually see it is up in the fallopian tube. Abortion refers to the loss of an embryo either or a fetus, either before the 20th week of pregnancy or before that embryo or fetus weighs 500 grams. And in this case, we're talking about a spontaneous abortion or a miscarriage. Usually this occurs within the first trimester of pregnancy. Um, and there are lots of different causes for a spontaneous abortion. Um, if mom is not in good health, if she's got some kind of hormonal imbalance, um, if the cervix is not staying closed, that's what we mean by incompetence of the cervix,
Um, the most common is some kind of fetal abnormality. The, the fetus, for whatever reason, has abnormal chromosomes, abnormal genes that just it cannot develop properly um, and dies off in the uterus as a result of that. That is, again, by far the most common reason for miscarriage. Um, when we talk about medical abortions, um, an induced abortion past about seven weeks is done with dilation and extraction, dilating the uterus and removing the fetus from, from the uterus. Um, prior to that, usually done using mifi mifepistrone and uh, a couple of other medications that stimulate uterine contractions. RH incompatibility occurs when mom is, uh, mom is RH negative, so she doesn't have that RH protein on the outside of her red blood cell. If you remember back um, at our, our uh, blood and immunity lecture, <clears throat> mom is RH negative. Baby, however, is RH positive. Baby does have that protein on the outside of their red blood cell. And when mom is RH negative, she is going to make antibodies against that RH positive blood, and those antibodies can cross the placenta and get into the baby and mix with the baby's blood. Now, usually your concern here is not with the first baby, um, because you usually don't see mixing of maternal and fetal blood until delivery, but the concern is with any subsequent babies, if she has another baby that's RH positive. So important to make sure you know mom's blood type. And then if she is RH negative, you will give um, HDN, Rogan, they call it. Um, if you suspect that the baby might be RH positive, you give it a couple of times during pregnancy and this keeps mom from making those antigen or those antibodies against the RH positive blood so that the baby is not born with you know, really bad anemia as a result of that RH incompatibility. As I mentioned earlier, you can sometimes see abnormalities of the placenta, um, usually based on where it's located in the uterus. So placenta previa happens when the placenta attaches either on top of the cervix or very, very close to the cervix, and sometimes in later stages of pregnancy or near delivery, you'll see bleeding because of this. The reason why placenta previa is a big concern, besides the bleeding, is that if the placenta is on top of the cervix, when the baby is delivered, the placenta is going to be the first thing that comes out, um, and then the baby. And that's bad because the placenta, remember, is the way that we get oxygen from mom to the baby. So if the placenta has detached and is coming out while the baby's still in the uterus, the baby's not getting any oxygen. Um, and this is a, a cause for emergency. Placental abruption happens when the placenta separates from the uterus prematurely. Um, this, you'll also see a lot of bleeding. Um, different things can cause this injury. You see this with um, maternal hypertension. So you would see this with something like preeclampsia. Uh, one of the reasons why preeclampsia is such a concerning condition you see it um, in women who are older. You can see it sometimes in women who have had a, a whole lot of kids because there's a lot of scar tissue on the uterus from all those previous placentas. This is also a big cause for emergency because again, if the placenta detaches from the uterus, baby's not getting any oxygen. Mastitis is inflammation of the breast and breast tissue. Usually this happens uh, fairly early on in breastfeeding, usually caused by either staph or strep bacteria. Signs and symptoms that you'll see, the breast tissue will be red and swollen, maybe very firm, very tender. Um, your patient will feel like they have an infection, fever, chills, just general fatigue, um, body aches. Treatment for mastitis will be antibiotics and then also um, nursing or pumping to get all of that infected milk out of the breast. And genital disorders are also known as birth defects. And there are a couple of different types. One is either a developmental disorder uh, wherein the baby does not develop properly while they're growing in the uterus. The other one is a hereditary um, disorder. We've looked at some of these already. We looked at cystic fibrosis. We looked at um, 
sickle cell anemia, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, um, a, a, a number of them. Genetic disorders can be caused by a change either in one gene or in multiple genes or a change in the chromosomes. You have, you know, more than one chromosome or more than two chromosomes or only one chromosome or the structure, part of one chromosome gets stuck to another. Um, the, the best example of change in number is probably trisomy 21, which is Down syndrome. Normally, you should only have two copies of chromosome 21. In trisomy 21, you have three copies, and that's what causes Down syndrome. You can also see some cases of Down syndrome where part of um, the 21st chromosome gets attached to another uh, chromosome, and you get kind of this crossover where you get an extra little bit of the chromosome on there. Um, that's a less common type of, of trisomy 21, but it does happen. We've talked about the idea of a carrier before. We talked about this with muscular dystrophy. Um, usually you see this when you have a recessive genetic disorder where you have to have two copies of the gene in order to be affected. So this is a person who carries the gene but is not affected by the disease However, this disease can be passed down to their um, children. Think about, again, what we talked about with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, how that is passed down from mother to son on the X chromosome. A teratogen is anything that causes a malformation in a developing embryo or fetus. Probably the one that you're most familiar with is alcohol, fetal alcohol syndrome. I think we've probably all heard of that. There are some infectious diseases that can be teratogens. Rubella is one. Rubella is the R in our MMR vaccine. And if a pregnant woman contracts rubella, that can be incredibly damaging to her baby, especially if she's very early in pregnancy. Um, that baby will often be born deaf, blind, um, and usually have profound mental retardation. There are certain drugs that can be teratogens, um, both drugs and drugs, so both your, your pharmaceuticals and whatever you pick up at Colfax and Federal. Um, a good example of this would be things like some of our acne medications um, that are, are really, really heavy duty doses of vitamin A, um, things like Retin-A, for example. Um, those, if you go on them, the doctor will usually talk to you about making sure you're on some kind of birth control because those medications will definitely um, damage that developing baby. Some chemicals will as well. Exposure to radiation is a teratogen. Um, another example of, of a drug is a, um, an anti-nausea medication that was used a lot in Europe back in the 50s and 60s. The drug's name is thalidomide. It's a very good anti-nausea medication and at the time was prescribed a lot for morning sickness um, and it was used all over the European continent. Very, very popular drug. Um, it never made it to America, actually, because the Surgeon General at that time or the director of the FDA, some, some very, very high up person, she looked at all of the research that was done regarding thalidomide and in pregnant women, decided that there wasn't enough research to determine that it was actually safe and banned the drug in the US. Um, it turns out thalidomide is a particularly devastating teratogen. Babies who were born to mothers who took thalidomide um, were born without arms or legs. They were missing several limbs. Um, so that's another good example of a drug that acts as a, a teratogen. There are different types of developmental disorders that you can see uh, due to teratogens. Atresia happens when you have either the absence or the closure of a normal body opening. You see this sometimes, babies that are born without an anus. Um, it's not there. You have to go in and surgically create one. Or babies who are born with their mouth kind of sealed shut. Um, that happens. It's very rare, but it does happen occasionally. Anencephaly is absence of the brain, usually the frontal lobes of the brain, the part of the brain that lets you think and reason. Um, cleft lip and palate um, occur when 
the lips and the palette don't see don't um, I guess suture together properly. Your face sort of folds together and comes together right above your top lip. And if that last step of it coming together doesn't happen properly, um, you'll see cleft lip and palate. This is very easy to fix surgically. Um, and then spina bifida occurs when the spine doesn't close properly. So normally the spine, you should have bones that enclose the whole spinal cord. Sometimes you'll see uh, one of those bones will be missing. We call this spina bifida occulta. Occult means hidden. So this is just hidden spina bifida. Um, and sometimes you'll have a patient with spina bifida occulta who doesn't know it. Um, and, and again, that's why they call it hidden. Sometimes you'll see right over that area a little um, dimple or a little tuft of hair. Um, sometimes not. The more severe cases of spina bifida are um, milo, meningocele, and meningocele. Um, this is a meningocele right here. The meninges of the spine are protruding out the back in a bubble. That's what we see on our baby right here. In a myelomeningocele, you get both the meninges and part of the spinal cord that protrudes out into the back. Um, this baby here may have a myelomeningocele for all I know, but he at least has a meningocele. Those are the meninges of the spine that you see on his back. This will require surgery to fix. You'll have to get the meninges back into the spine, and if the spinal cord is on the back, get the spinal cord back into the spine as well. Um, rates of success vary on, on spina bifida. Um, it can be very difficult to surgically fix. Sometimes um, you'll see prolonged effects afterwards. Often a, a baby who's born with spina bifida with a myelomeningocele will have issues with the lower limbs, issues with bowel and bladder control, may not be able to walk. Sometimes you'll see issues with mental retardation. Um, sometimes you'll see what we see in the baby up here, a hydrocephalus. You'll see increased fluid on the brain, um, which is a very common thing that you see with spina bifida. Um, interestingly, there, there's more and more of a trend towards spe treating spina bifida in the womb. We can detect spina bifida on an ultrasound, and it's getting more and more common when you detect spina bifida to go in while the baby's still in utero, open up mom, open up the uterus, correct the spina bifida in the baby, and then sew the uterus back up and sew mom back up. Um, this, if, if spina bifida is treated that early, it usually has much better outcomes. The baby has more time to develop properly. And this surgical technique since seems to have some pretty good results. How do we diagnose different congenital disorders? Usually you start by noticing something like that in an ultrasound. From there, if you suspect a genetic disorder, you'll do an amniocentesis, which is a big long needle that goes into the uterus and into the amniotic sac and draws out a little bit of amniotic fluid. And then you can test that fluid. Um, you can test the cells in it and look at their genetic material if you suspect like a trisomy 21. Chorionic villus sampling involves taking a little bit of tissue from where uh, the placenta meets the uterus. Um, this is, usually you'll do this if you have, you suspect something very severe and you want to know what's going on because CVS can increase the risk of miscarriage. Um, it's not done commonly. So that is it for the second half of the reproductive lecture. Thank you for hanging in there. I know this is a long one. As always, if you have questions or you would like further information about something that we talked about, um, please stop by. I would love to see you at office hours. Um, these last few slides here are just some more key terms, giving you know definitions of stuff that we've gone over. Um, check these out while you're working on your homework and studying for the quiz.